find me. I'm going to talk to you about my business, but I'm going to talk to you about something bigger, citizen commerce as well. I'm really declaring to today and every day the end of nameless, faceless business. It's time for us to take back the shelves. It's time for us to reshape commerce together, and I describe that as citizen commerce. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background because I'm going to make a lot of big claims and a very big vision and I need to substantiate why maybe I have half a clue about what I'm talking about. First of all, I grew up um, on the wrong side of the tracks in Detroit. I'm, I'm the first person in my family and I think my whole neighborhood to go to college. And that's a really important thing for me as an entrepreneur because when you do something really young that is improbable, to do some, to other things later in your life they don't seem so intimidating when you've done it at, say, you know, 14 or 17 or 18. Um, I did get a couple fancy degrees, as Denise mentioned. I went to uh, first University of Michigan. I studied industrial design, so I'm a product designer. Um, and I did go on to Harvard Business School. And I've worked in three startups. This is the first I founded, and I was at two other ones. Um, my first was a product development consultancy. And I worked for three big brands for a woman who's now running for governor here in this state, Meg Whitman. So I worked for Meg Whitman at Hasbro, at StrideRight, at Keds. And I learned an awful lot about how products get developed in big companies and how they get distributed. Then I, ran, I went on most recently after a long stint in Ireland to run a social network called Ziggs. So I'm, if anyone can be a, an expert on social media, which is not really anyone because it moves too fast, I'm, I'm close to it. Um, here's what I believe. As a designer, I know that we're seeing an unprecedented democratization of innovation in the world for innovating around everything, products, services, and this is amazing to me and it's the core of why my business exists. I'll, I'll, I'll move on and, and tell you, uh, substantiate that. Um, but consumption patterns around us are also moving to a new normal. I believe that every purchase we make is an expression or an act of citizenship of some sort. It amplifies something in the world by what we buy, what we don't buy, something good, something bad, something indifferent. And that's something that's, I'm not alone in that thinking. That thinking is becoming more and more prominent. Um, but we have a problem. There's a, there's, a, there's a problem I'm trying to fix. The existing retail and distribution systems are really broken. They don't support and they don't expose that kind of innovation and they don't give us access to the information we need to make the choices we would like to make when we do buy something or don't buy something. But there's hope and the, and the hope is citizen commerce. And so citizen commerce is a movement that's really enabled by social media. That's why Tori sitting here tweeting today is not a small thing. Thing to me. For her to expose this conference is a meaningful thing and we're, we're doing that within the, con the, uh, the context of my business as well, using social media to amplify important messages. So what we do, that's a lot of like highfalutin stuff, but what do we do concretely? Once a day we discover and launch one inventive product and we lead with the story of the products. We create a video review of that product to give you the information to understand who's behind it and what they're doing. And all of the ideas, or most of our ideas, come from communities. So people like you suggest products. They come from all over the world. Products that deserve support, companies that deserve support, people that deserve support. So we're really powered by community, and community is what amplifies what we do. Simply, we, how we exist, how we monetize is commerce. So we sell these products. We give them a, a new distribution channel as well. So I'm going, to, I'm going to show you one of our videos. We, we cover 30 different categories, and I always struggle with what video to show, because if I show you the soap from Afghanistan, you're going to think we do soap every day. If I show you nightgowns from Haiti, you're going to think we do nightgowns every day. I'm going to do one that's a little closer to home for me. It's a, um, a product out of Maine. I, so I'm, I'm from Boston. Maine is close by. It's the fifth poorest state in the country. And this company is one that's helping to create industry and jobs and also has a green aspect. So it's called the right mat. It's a doormat. We don't do doormats every day, but this is a doormat product. <laughs> Good morning, I'm 
on my way to Waldeboro, Maine. It's about three and a half hours from Daily Grommet in Lexington, and I'm going to meet with the guys at Custom Cordage. These guys take float rope, which can't be used by fishermen anymore, and they take that old rope, they recycle it, and make the most beautiful doormats you've ever seen. Uh, my name is David Bird. I own Custom Cordage, where we make braided rope and twine. All this rope is coming out of the ocean due to new re federal regulations that require the fishermen to take it out of the water because it's floating and they have to change over to sinking line. A nonprofit organization called the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation purchases this rope back from the fishermen to help them with the purchase of new sinking line, so it helps the fishermen. They're a very functional mat, very colorful, and uh, it's, it's a great durable product. I have some of these mats that I've made out of new rope, maybe 15 to 20 years ago, that are still working fine today. So they're a very, very durable product, and they work very well at getting the mud off your shoes. We've been in business making mats now for about a year and a half, going on two years, and to date we've sold about 15,000 doormats and recycled roughly 100,000 pounds of rope. So I had a great adventure up in Maine. I mean, this is beautiful country, and these guys are right on the coast in northern Maine. And that community depends on the fishing industry, truly depends on the fishing industry. I was there to pick out ropes for our mats, which was very, very fun. But I learned that the reason that, uh, for so many colored ropes is that the colors will signify on a lobster boat different lengths of rope. I learned also that their main business is to make high-performance marine ropes, and the machinery is fantastic. It's absolutely fascinating to watch. It's these twirly things moving around like this, and out comes this gorgeous rope. Custom Cordage was recently recognized by the Maine State Senator Olympia Snow for not only helping the local lobster industry, but also keeping people employed year-round. The mats that we're going to be featuring are going to be made out of these two colors of ropes. Here's a charcoal gray with a natural, a bright blue with yellow, very fun, very summery, and finally, Happy. So these ropes are really, really durable. I mean, they are meant to withstand the ocean. And they're actually made to repel water, but they also repel dirt. So all the dirt from your shoes ends up on. So it goes on to finish with a little more functional information because you might want to buy, buy the mat as well. Um, so this is what we do. Oops. There we go. This is what we do every day at noon, Eastern Standard Time. We launch a new product. Um, we've been recognized recently. We had a huge article in the New York Times last month, and I really liked what, that's me on my dock in Maine. I have a little place up in Maine. The first time I saw the article, all excited. And um, I liked what the, the author um, wrote. She said, finding entrepreneurs whose sagas say something insightful about business culture other than just buy my product isn't always a cinch. That's why Jules Pieri and Joanne Domeniconi at Spire Awe, that was really exciting for us. Um, so let me talk to you about this democratization of innovation. Um, uh, this quote is great. It's from an economist in, in the UK, and he says, the rate of cultural and economic progress depends on the rate at which ideas are having sex. And let me tell you, with the internet, that is the world's the bedroom. It's unbelievable how we have access to the ideas we need to innovate. Um, the tools to innovate around physical products are much more accessible than they used to be. So. Uh, Something like an industrial lathe, which used to cost $200,000, is now $15,000. The, the CNC machines, you can get, um, CNC is really important to prototyping. MakerBot makes a CNC machine for $250. You don't have to be a person like I was, a designer in a big company with access to major resources to innovate anymore. We see it every day at Daily Gromit. Products coming from college students, from disaffected cube dwellers, from um, stay-at-home moms with lots of creativity and energy, senior citizens who see a problem and they solve it. So, so what? It's not just about putting more things out into the world. It's about creating good within the world to amplify something meaningful. Sometimes that's a technology innovation. Sometimes it's a simple problem solver or a green or a social enterprise. Sometimes it's preserving craft or a community. This is what we can do when we all have access to innovation and the tools to innovate. Around the consumption, because nothing matters without demand, there are huge sea changes happening around us. We're living in this age of amazing corporate 
distrust in betrayal, whether it's uh, economic betrayal or environmental betrayal, we've learned in a way that um, is unsettling to, to be skeptical. But we're not pessimistic. We're looking for leadership. We're looking for companies and people we can trust. And we want to be those people as well. So that's an opportunity. And I, I see this thing happening that I've never seen before, which is there are two populations colliding right now. Millennials, many of you in the room, you have an unbelievable blend of idealism and pragmatism. So you don't mind that Apple's going to make a profit on, on an iPod, but you love to see that they do a red of a collaboration with Project Red. You want to know, well, what, what else are you doing in the world, Mr. Enterprise, Mrs. Enterprise? And an older population, which the U.S. is now, our mean age is 43, also seeks sort of spirituality and values in their purchases and their experiences. Those two things are colliding right now, and that's incredibly powerful. So here are three examples of larger companies way ahead of Daily Gromit that have scaled around values because values and trust are at the core of everything I'm describing. Apple has scaled around delivering reliable product that you can trust. They have your back when it comes to simplifying certain technologies. That's why they've scaled. Zappos, many people, if you're a shoe maven, you know Zappos. Zappos is not the cheapest place to buy your shoes, but they've scaled because the kind of service they give, which is entirely down to the individual, being a real person, helping you with your problem, is meaningful to people. It's humanized something that could be very dehumanized, online shoe shopping. Whole Foods is really succeeding around values, around connecting that company's values to your values if you're a Whole Foods customer. It's not a small thing that when somebody goes grocery shopping, they usually say, I'm going grocery shopping. But when they're going to Whole Foods, they say, I'm going to Whole Foods. They're stating something about themselves. So I've just made a claim that there are zillions of interesting products, but where are they all? Where are they all hiding? Basically, this, the retail systems and essentially the big boxification of our retail systems do, does not support uh, innovation, and they do kill the independent retailers who do. I saw this very d directly when I worked at Play School. Our, our number of products halved in two years because our customers reduced down to four companies. But the good news is social media is really our, our white knight in this situation. You know what citizen journalism is, where we people have reshaped journalism, we can do that to commerce right now. And three ideas that foreshadowed this would be eBay, Etsy, Etsy's like eBay for crafts, and Craigslist, where something that seemed completely improbable was possible because of the internet. Well, the social media is even more powerful to making the improbable possible. And so is video. So when is kale not just kale? If you go to Walmart and you see kale sitting lonely on the shelf, and you don't know how to cook it, it doesn't matter what it costs. You go to a farmer's market and somebody explains how, to, how they grew it and how to cook it, it suddenly has amazing perceived value. And, and that's what we can do through social media and through video, Daily Gromit in particular, we take people to the farmer's market effectively, to the artist studio, to the tech lab. Our products, as I mentioned earlier, all come from regular people suggesting them. So here's the creator of a product, and below is the finder of this particular robot, robotized gutter cleaner. Um, every day when we kick off a product, we kick off a discussion with the creator. So this is a grass seed that needs watering only for its very first month of life and only needs cutting once a month. That's revolutionary. It's a, it's a green product, and you can talk to the creator of the product the day that we launch the product and get all your grass growing questions answered. And in terms of how I behave in a C as a CEO, social media is very meaningful. People have called me the see through CEO. I talk all the time about what we care about, what we're thinking about, when we make mistakes, what, what, what people um, in our company are thinking about. So it, I, I'm just sort of all over there online and that's, in, that's important. So the power curve's changed because of social media. It's, to, to be successful is no longer about being scaled, to be big, to be slick, to, to have more resources. It's about, it's about being authentic and accessible and responsive, which really levels the p playing field, and trust is central to that. Um, uh, 
So I'm just going to conclude with a couple of things, that sort of recommendations around our lives, things that can matter for all of us. If you have a product, use your David versus Goliath advantages, the ones I've just described. Be visible and accessible through social media. Big companies can't do that as well as you can. Display your personality. Um, use video and podcasts to tell your story. I saw a couple already today. And if you have a product idea, send it to us. Um, on Twitter, hashtag uh, Grauman Idea, and um, we have a form on our site. One last thing I'm just going to say is, um, as you think about your own budget, whether you're a student or you're a family budget, think about transferring 10% of your, your purchases to things that matter to you, whether it's local retail, which is incredibly important, or it's the type of products that support your values. It doesn't mean that 90% you know, of what you buy has to be at a farmer's market, but just 10% is incredibly important because we form 65% of our economy.